Next up, we'd like to take a closer look at the impact of language, more specifically media language, on bias. The tree of understanding, media, language and bias here to talk to you about it. Please welcome Alexandra Karashinska, Editor-in-Chief Forbes Women Polska. Alexandra, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you well. Thank you. Hello, Łukasz. It's fantastic to have you with us today. And what a topic. Well, as you said, I'm a media media expert for 20 years, and sadly, this is a reality in media business. Um, a call, I'll give you a few numbers first. So according to Global Media Monitoring Project, there is only 24% of women in the news coverage globally. Um, so obviously 76 are men. And this lack of uh, representation uh, goes uh, beyond le legacy media. It's not only TV, it's not only radio, it's not, not only uh, press, but also digital media. Um, fun fact, there is uh, 27 C we female CEOs in the United States. So from all CEOs, 27 are female. And if you search their names in Google, you can find only 11% of images as women. So if you're looking from the Google search perspective, you, all, you see the business leader image as men. Um, so obviously there is a bias in Google search. There is, a, um, there is a research by University of Washington also that uh, if you look for the authors in Google, uh, you will find mostly men authors and only 25% of people mentioned as authors of uh, uh, science uh, authors are men. Whereas in reality, uh, actual US authors, there's 56%. So majority of authors actually more than half uh, are women. So, um, also, I can give you an example from here, from Poland. Last year, we had huge uh, women protests, strikes um, driven by a strict anti-abortion law. And if you look at this um, process fr from the media perspective, all the major TV stations, all the ma major uh, TV news uh, were discussing the issue, discussing the, pro uh, the protest and the commentators were mostly men. So for me, it's a hugely bizarre situation when there is a women freedom and women health issue and the subject is discussed mostly by men, unfortunately. Alexandra, tell me, because from what you're saying, it's, it's kind of inevitable that the only possible conclusion is that the media do treat men and women differently. But from your experience, is it really the case that journalists actually invite fewer women than men as guests, as interview experts well, for are... TV? Yes. Sorry, sorry. Um, it's okay. So there are a few things. There are a few things here. Um, it is true that uh, media people, producers, journalists do not invite women to take part in conversation. The question is why? So first, uh, I also worked in uh, news TV for several years and uh, I also were um, a TV producer, so I know how it works. Um, First of all, it's just a simple indolence. Many producers, many uh, uh, TV uh, journalists will say there are no women experts. So in this part, particular topic, which is obviously they? not true. Yes, which is ob this is very often um, uh, the, the, the issue, which is obviously not true because there are plenty of women experts. Women are uh, highly educated. Uh, for example, here in Poland, we have more women with a master degree than men with master degree. So obviously there are women experts. Mm. I think very recently there was a stat, uh, I'm not sure if it was from Eurostat, but anyway, what it said that the percentage of female graduates from, uh, from sciences in general uh, is the highest in the EU at 43%, if I remember correctly. 
I, I believe it's so. I believe it's so. So there are experts. Uh, it's not true. There are, are not. Uh, it's not possible to find a female expert on a specific topic. But second, it is true that it's a little bit harder sometimes to invite a female expert to the studio or to, or to the show uh, to take part in the conversation. Why is that? It's, it's because it's a simple reason. Female experts usually are very busy with other responsibilities, with home responsibilities, with, at home if they care, they take or care for their children. Uh, so it's simply they have usually very little time besides their work hours. So um, this is true. On the other hand, from my and experience, the male experts, when I... on the other hand, like to roam around carelessly chatting with everyone about everything. <laughs> well, they, uh, you know, these are uh, these are stereotypes you, we mentioned. But yes, it's very often that uh, male experts realize uh, how important it is to be a public figure, how important it is to uh, take part in the conversation and build the, their personal brand. So yes, it is. Uh, and it's also, uh, we can see it in the statistics that usually bigger part of the unpaid homework are done by, by females. So yes, it is true that uh, women are just simply do not have time to have uh, these other activities. But uh, to be fair, I have to tell you that uh, women decline invitation very often if they are not feeling that they are uh, like totally prepared, like they're fully prepared, because there is uh, this strive to, perf to be perfect, perfect, perfectionism. And it's also uh, for, uh, I think it's also uh, because uh, the way we are brought up, it's because the, the gender roles we are uh, put into, young girls are taught to be perfect, uh, to be nice, to be perfect. and. And it goes uh, uh, on when uh, when there is a women leader, when there is women expert, and I try to invite her to have a interview. And she says, um, "Well, it's if it's not one hundred per percent uh, aligned with her area of expertise, she would decline usually." Whereas there are many men who said, "Okay, I know something. Let's have a conversation." So what you're saying, Alexandra, is that men are more like politicians in that they can talk about anything. The only thing they expect you to do is invite them, uh, whereas women are more responsible in principle. So what, you, what you're saying is it's more psychological. It's more about predispositions because the big question, why is that the case? Why do we have this imbalance? So what you're saying seems to drive us towards the conclusion that it's the force of habit in the sense it's been like that for decades that uh, male anchors invited male experts predominantly and there are a variety of reasons why women sometimes refuse to to join the conversation and there are also those psychological reasons i would say they are not predominant they are basically gender roles. This is how we are brought up uh, to be perfect, to be uh, organized, to be also quiet and uh, not stand up, uh, like not take uh, part in the conversations. So just, you know, uh, be nice. What you're saying is as if I was reading the Scarlet Letter again. <laughs> but, but I it presume is. Sometimes it it's, is. It's a bit different. You're right. But tell me. Uh, let's let's look at the consequences of such a such a media gap. Uh, can you discuss those and prioritize them, Abs perhaps? Absolutely. You know, when I uh, when I'm asked about this issue, and I always quote American uh, activist Marianne Wright Edelman, and she said, "You can't be what you can't see." So if you can't see women experts, women leaders in the media, uh, those role models for younger people, for younger girls, for younger boys. But basically, you cannot strive. You, ca you can't have ambitions to become a women leader, a politician or a businesswoman or women in science because you, you basically don't have these role models. So, um, yes, also role models of men as fathers, as caregivers, as uh, 
um, uh, people who care for the family. So yes, this is important to, you know, media is for me like a mirror. It's, uh, it's obvious. We, this is uh, how the society is uh, shown, how, how the biases are also created. So if we don't have women in science, like women experts, why there, this is the reason why we have few, fewer uh, girls uh, trying to um, have their careers in uh, science, in mathematics, in engineering, or in computer science. Uh, it's, um, I think, yes, this is the, the obvious consequence. So we're dealing with what is double standards fundamentally but if we were to be a little bit more optimistic tell me is it really such a pervasive reality still in the 21st century or is it more of an outdated illusion that this is still happening it is still happening i'm i'm, af I'm afraid i i just uh uh, did a research as an editor of Forbes Women of Polish media uh, outlets, especially in TV, and we monitored together with the institution called uh, uh, Media Monitoring Institute here in Poland, and we monitored TV uh, news outlets for a month and uh, topics concerning women concerning half of the society were only 20%. And this is something that the, the, the level of the uh, of the um, of the news stable, I'm, I'm afraid. So there is no progress. But uh, you you ask me to be more positive, maybe. So I will tell you this: um, it is true that media are biased. It is true that uh, internet is biased. Algorithm can be biased, but you can How positive use of you. also. <laughs> Yes, but but uh, you can use the algorithm in a positive way. And I can give you example from my own company. We have this initiative called uh, Equal Voice Initiative. And it's basically an algorithm working in all our media online sites. And it basically shows you numbers, how many, how often women are mentioned. And it's uh, it often says what you can measure, what can be is what can be done yes what can you what, what what you understand what you measure is what you understand so we allow journalists we allow uh, editors in chief to measure their performance their uh, content so they see if they are basically talking about half of the population yes if they mention experts, if uh, we have uh, women on uh, on the picture, yes, uh, when you read an article, and it's in real time, so it's um, it's a first it's step a very for me. It is. It's a very interesting yeah. example, Alexandra. When when someone, in this case you, uses the word algorithm in a positive sense, because I believe this word hasn't exactly acquired the positive connotations in the past few years. <laughs> It is yeah, not, but basically, yes, uh, we are because uh, you, we connect, we like very often think about big uh, platforms like Facebook or Google, like Amazon and YouTube and what it does to basically how uh, platforms can uh, manipulate people. Absolutely. This, there's huge discussion around this, but, um, you know, uh, you asked me about positive change, uh, diversity, inclusion and equality is for me, it's a leadership issue. And we see it in the United States because after the uh, Biden administration took charge, uh, all the major TV station decided their uh, correspondence from the White House will be women. So it's ABC, CBS, NBC and CNN, uh, these four big uh, networks they have women reporters now in the white house and for me it's a huge change uh, i used to work in the news i used to work in tv station and the fact that the the most important political topics will be covered by women in those you know huge uh, networks i think it's a very big difference it makes a huge and it will make an impact I think you have a very impressive portfolio, Alexandra, when it comes to the actual exposure to this phenomenon. Can you tell me, uh, going back to the language itself, what role does it play in cementing those stereotypes? Can we think of specific examples? Because we understand the stats, 
that you have just quoted. And I'm sure we will both agree there is not enough awareness about this gap. It's actually still huge. And those discrepancies are kind of it's difficult to describe them, really. Well, yes, obviously, those biases, those stereotypes are deeply rooted in the language itself. And this is something I, I talk to my students. Um, you know, I, um, I always uh, tell them about this great uh, poet by our um, Nobel Prize winner, uh, Wisława Szymborska. Uh, great poet and uh, very wise woman. And there is this poem, uh, Tree of Understanding, the Tree of Understanding. And she, she said, uh, the man had views, the woman still just a whim. The equivalent of his willpower was her womanly stubbornness and his caution, her calculation. And in, in situations where a man was called a tactician, the woman remained intriguer. So this is, uh, this is from Szymborska, a Nobel Prize winner in literature. Uh, we see what she says is that those double standards, the biases are basically in the language. This is the way we, we describe people, describe roles. But do you honestly think things like that can still happen on air without any consequences? Absolutely, 100%. You know, as an editor of Forbes Women, uh, I see very often uh, ambitious women, Polish business women, called aggressive, loud, arrogant, or even hysterical in during the disputes uh, where there's not there to are mention men. all the sexual innuendos of course absolutely absolutely many uh, um, very uh, top politicians uh, female politicians are commented in media by their looks how what they dress and uh, how they move uh, not what they say and what they do in uh, in their agenda so absolutely there is a double standards when I mention women called aggressive or hysterical, in the same in the same situations, men are called driven or dedicated or involved. So absolutely, my colleague, a philosopher and a public figure, Dr. Katarzyna Kasia, is uh, in a Polish uh, TV studio. Was called Pani Kasia, so uh, Kate, basically, whereas her a colleague, a professor, was called Professor. Uh, what can you tell us? Yes. So uh, she was called by her first name. And this is, uh, this is outrageous, actually, because she is a scientist and also, um, and also working on a university. So we I do couldn't. still have, uh, yes, we do. And it happened recently. So we, yes, we, we still have these double, uh, double standards and, uh, and biases in, in the media. Which brings me to the final question, I'm sad to say, because I wish we had at least one hour to talk about it. It's such an important topic and hopefully we will one day, Alexandra, be able to get deeper into it. But the final question on the positive side would be, what should we do about it in a prioritized sense? Uh, what kind of actions do you see as top priorities? After all, your portfolio is extremely impressive. You've had a lot of exposure to all kinds of media outlets. Can you tell us what are the key number one uh, initiatives that should be implemented, hopefully as soon as possible? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, what is measured can be done. Yes, what is measured is understood. So I will strongly recommend media leaders to look at their um, at their numbers and uh, their quotas and uh, representation. And it's not only about men and women, it's basically about diversity. So people of color, uh, minorities, absolutely, we, we, we need all these voices in media because this is how society looks like and this uh, the and media should mirror the, the way society is. So um, absolutely, first of all, uh, we need also um, education and uh, to realize how important it is to have uh, women in the conversation in news in media and in politics also so we need role models 
And in my organization, we have a list of female experts that we share in all our newsrooms and we collaborate to, to make an effort to make an extra effort to have women experts on uh, experts on board. Uh, but also, you know, in conferences like this one, um, or in uh, public speeches or in public uh, situations where we discuss issues, um, we need to have women in the conversation. So I strongly uh, ask, like, you know, encourage men not to take part in the discussion, whereas there is no woman there. So, so like strongly object. So way, where are women experts in the panel? Uh, if there are any, just refuse to take part in it because the, the you know, I always say, uh, without 50% of the uh, society, 50% of the population, it is not a fair representation. There is no democ democracy without women. I have facilitated and emceed over 300 conferences. And if there is one thing in common about all of them, it is female underrepresentation in debates. It's still very often the case that you have panels with seven, eight, ten speakers and one woman at best. Uh, that's what happens. Uh, Alexander, as I said, it would be fantastic to talk more about it, but I would like to thank you on behalf of also the conference organizers, because I believe you're at the forefront of very important work done. And I wish there was more awareness, more statistics that we could be sharing with everyone we can to make people realize of how important this is, because I'm sure we'll both agree that there are two types of bias here. One is quite deliberate, which is rooted in someone's convictions. And the, the other one is more on the careless side, more on the involuntary side. People are not even Unconscious. aware. Exactly. So once again, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Alexandra Karashinska, Editor-in-Chief, Forbes Women, Polska. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having me.